I want your soul. Unlike Nazi concentration camps, in which prisoners were used as forced labor, extermination camps, such as Treblinka, had only one function, to murder those who were sent there. To prevent incoming victims from realizing the camp's true nature, Treblinka too was disguised as a transit camp for deportations further east, complete with unreal train schedules, a fake train station clock with hands painted on it, names of destinations and routes, a fake ticketing window, and the sign Obermajdan, a code word for Treblinka commonly used to deceive prisoners arriving from Western Europe. Majdan was a pre-war landed estate about three miles away from the camp. Treblinka was the second deadliest extermination camp to be built and operated by Nazi Germany in occupied Poland during World War II. During this time, it is estimated that between 700,000 and 900,000 Jews were murdered in its gas chambers, along with 2,000 Romani people. More Jews were murdered at Treblinka than at any other Nazi extermination camp apart from Auschwitz. The camp was managed by the German SS with assistance from Trawaniki guards and the camp consisted of two separate units. Treblinka I was a forced labor camp whose prisoners worked in the gravel pit or irrigation area and in the forest where they cut wood to fuel the cremation pits. Between 1941 and 1944, more than half of its 20,000 inmates were murdered via shootings, hunger, disease, in mistreatment. On September 1st of 1941, it opened, and a new barracks and barbed wire fencing were erected high later that year. To obtain the workforce for Treblinka 1, civilians were sent to the camp in masses for real or imagined defenses, and sentenced to hard labor by the Gestapo office. The average length of a sentence was six months, but many prisoners had their sentences extended indefinitely. 20,000 people passed through Treblinka 1 during its three-year existence. About half of them were murdered via exhaustion, hunger, and disease. Those who survived were released after serving their sentences, and these were generally Poles from nearby villages in Poland. Treblinka I's commandant was Theodore van Eupen. According to Franziszek Zabecki, the local station master, Eupen often murdered prisoners by taking shots at them as if they were partridges. A widely feared overseer was Franz Schwarz, who killed prisoners with a pickaxe or a hammer. Women mainly worked in the sorting barracks, where they repaired and cleaned military clothing delivered by freight trains, while most of the men worked at the gravel mine. There were no work uniforms, and inmates who lost their own shoes were forced to go barefoot or scavenge them from dead prisoners. Water was rationed, and punishments were regularly delivered at roll calls. Beginning in December of 1943, all inmates were no longer carrying any specific sentences. They were there, indefinitely. The second camp, Treblinka II, was the extermination camp, referred to euphemistically as the SS Sonderkommando, Treblinka, by the Nazis. A small number of Jewish men who were not murdered immediately upon arrival became members of its Sonderkommando, whose jobs included being forced to bury the victims' bodies in mass graves. Treblinka II was divided into three parts, K-1, 
Camp 1 was the administrative compound where the guards lived. Camp 2 was the receiving area where incoming transports of prisoners were offloaded, and Camp 3 was the location of the gas chambers. The entire death camp was surrounded by two rows of barbed wire fencing. This fence was later woven with pine tree branches to obstruct the view of the camp from the outside. The Germans took a lot of care to hide the camps. The first section of Treblinka II was Wohnlager, administrative and residential compound. It had a telephone line. The main road within the camp was paved and named after Kurt Seidel, the SSS corporal who supervised its construction. A few side roads were lined with gravel. The main gate for road traffic was then erected on the north side. Barracks were built up with supplies delivered from Warsaw and Kazkow Lackey. There was a kitchen, a bakery, and dining rooms. All were equipped with high-quality items taken from Jewish ghettos. The Germans and Ukrainians each had their own sleeping quarters, positioned at an angle for better control of all entrances. There were also two barracks behind an inner fence for the Jewish work commandos, known as the Sonder Commandos. SS Kurt Franz set up a small zoo in the center next to his horse stables, containing two foxes, two peacocks, and a roe deer. This zoo was introduced in 1943. Smaller rooms were built as laundry, tailors, and cobblers, and for woodworking and medical aid for the Nazi soldiers. Closest to the SS quarters were separate barracks for the Polish and Ukrainian women who served, cleaned, and worked in the kitchen. The next section of Treblinka II was the receiving area where the railway unloading ramp extended from the Treblinka line into the camp. There was a long and narrow platform surrounded by barbed wire fencing. A new building erected on the platform was what was disguised as a railway station, complete with a wooden clock and fake rail terminal signs. The Nazi soldiers wanted to make it appear to the incoming Jews that they were going to be moving from one train station to the next. But there was no such train station. This was all a ruse. SS Joseph Hurtrider, who worked on the unloading ramp, was known for being especially cruel. He would often grab crying toddlers by their feet and smash their heads against the wagons. Behind a second fence were two large barracks used for undressing, with a cashier's booth where money and jewelry were collected, ostensibly for safekeeping. Jews who resisted were taken away or beaten to death by the guards. On the other side of the path from the men was where women and children were taken and had their hair cut off. The hair was later sent to Germany and used to manufacture socks. All buildings in the lower camp, including the barber barracks, contained the piled up clothing and belongings of the prisoners. Behind the station building, further to the right, there was a sorting square where all baggage was first collected by the Lumpen Commando. It was flanked by a fake infirmary called the Lazaret, with the Red Cross sign on it. It was a small barrack surrounded by barbed wire, where the sick, old, wounded, and difficult prisoners were taken. Directly behind the Lazaret shack, there was an open excavation pit, 23 feet deep. Often, women and children were led to the edge of the pit and shot one at a time by Will Mentz, nicknamed Frankenstein, by the inmates of the camp. Mentz single-handedly killed thousands of Jews, aided by his supervisor, August Mita. Mita was called the Angel of Death by the prisoners and would dress up as a medic when he would greet them often joking to the other German soldiers that he would cure each Jew with a single pill. Mita also supervised the nearby selection square for forced labor in the camp. He would walk about, checking Jewish prisoners, 
Those whom he deemed too sick or weak to work at the required pace were taken from the selection area to the lazaret. Mita would then stand each man near the pit where a fire was constantly burning, calmly aim his gun, and shoot them. Sometimes he would instruct the victims to undress first, but other times he would just kill them and kick them into the pit to burn. He would also search prisoners. If he found money, food, or anything at all, he would beat them brutally before marching them again to the lazaret. In events where he found nothing incriminating, he would still fabricate a reason to beat the prisoner and still bring them to the lazaret. Mita is did the living barracks and hospital rooms for the prisoners, where he would remove the sick from the barracks and shoot them. He described his own actions in court testimony as, There were always sick and crippled people in the transports. There were also those who had been shot and wounded en route by the SS, policemen, or Latvians who guarded the transports. These ill, crippled, and wounded passengers were brought to the lazarette by a special group of workers. Inside, they placed or lay these people at the edge of the pit. When all the sick and wounded had been brought forward, it was my job to shoot them. I fired at the nape of the neck with a 9mm pistol. Those shot would fall into the pit. The number of people shot in this way from each transport varied sometimes two or three, and sometimes twenty or even more. They included men and women, young and old, and also children. His testimony then concluded on the lazaret. The pit was also used to burn old worn-out clothes and identity papers deposited by new arrivals at the undressing area. Mita also sought out victims from other parts of the camp to be brought to the lazaret and shot Victims whom Kurt Franz had injured with his hunting rifle or boxing gloves. Prisoners who had been whipped for various crimes or other reasons. Mita would decide that these prisoners were too weakened from the blows sustained and no longer fit for work. So he would shoot them as well. The third section of Treblinka, Camp 3, also referred to as the Upper Camp, was the main killing zone, with the gas chambers at its center. It was completely screened from the railway tracks by an earth bank built with the help of a mechanical digger. The mound was elongated in shape, similar to a retaining wall, and can be seen in a sketch produced during the 1967 trial of Treblinka II. From the undressing barracks, a fenced-off path led through the forested area to the chambers. The SS cynically called it the road to heaven, or der Schlock, the tube. Once at the gas chambers, and after undressing, newly arrived Jews were beaten with whips to drive them towards the chambers. Hesitant men were treated particularly brutally. Rudolf Haas, the commandant at Auschwitz, invented the practice at Treblinka, of deceiving the victims about the showers with his own camp's practice of telling them they had to go through a delousing process. This meant that they would convince them to clean themselves off of lice, often giving them soap and hand towels as they walked them into the chambers. According to the post-war testimony of some SS officers, the men were always gassed first while women and children waited outside the chambers for their turn. During this time, the women and children could hear the sounds of suffering from inside the chambers and screaming, and then they became aware of what awaited them, which caused panic, distress, and even involuntary defecation. Many survivors of the Treblinka camp testified that an officer known as Ivan the Terrible was responsible for operating the gas chambers. While many Jews awaited their fate outside the chambers, Ivan the Terrible allegedly tortured, beat, and murdered many of them. Survivors witnessed Ivan beat victims' heads open with a pipe, cut victims with a sword or a bayonet, cut off noses and ears, or gouge out their eyes. 
One survivor testified that Ivan murdered an infant by bashing it against a wall. Another claimed that he raped a young girl before cutting her abdomen open and letting her bleed to death. The true identity of the guard referred to as Ivan the Terrible has never been conclusively determined, even to this day. The gas chambers were completely enclosed by a high wooden fence. Originally, they consisted of three interconnected barracks and were disguised as showers. They had double walls insulated by earth packed down in between. The interior walls and ceilings were lined with roofing paper. The floors were covered with tin-plated sheet metal, the same material used for the roof. Solid wooden doors were insulated with rubber and bolted from the outside by heavy crossbars. The killing process at Treblinka differed significantly from the method used at Auschwitz and Majdanek, where the poison gas Zyklon B, which was hydrogen cyanide, was used. At Treblinka and two other camps, the victims were murdered by suffocation and carbon monoxide poisoning from engine exhaust in stationary gas chambers. After visiting Treblinka on a guided tour, Auschwitz Commandant Rudolf Haas concluded that using exhaust gas was inferior to the cyanide used at his extermination camp. The chambers became silent after 12 minutes and were closed for 20 minutes or less. According to Jankil Wiernik, who survived the 1943 prisoner uprising and escaped, when the doors of the gas chambers had been opened, the bodies of the victims were standing and kneeling rather than lying down due to the severe overcrowding of the chamber. Dead mothers embraced the bodies of their children. Prisoners who worked in the Sonder Commandos later testified that the dead frequently let out a last gasp of air when they were extracted from the chambers. Some victims even showed signs of life during the disposal of the corpses but the German Nazi guards refused to react and continued to bury them, whether they were alive or not. Later, the Germans became aware of the political danger associated with the mass burial of corpses in April of 1943, after they discovered the graves of Polish victims of the 1940 Katyn massacre carried out by the Soviets near Smolensk. Subsequently, the Nazi leadership concerned about covering up their own crimes, issued the secret orders to exhume the corpses buried at death camps and burn them. The cremations began shortly after Himmler's visit to the camp in late February or early March of 1943. To incinerate the bodies, large cremation pits were constructed at Camp 3 within Treblinka 2. The burning pyres were used to cremate the new corpses along with the old ones, which had to be dug up as they had been buried during the first six months of the camp's operation. Built under the instructions of the camp's cremation expert, the pits consisted of railroad rails laid as grates on blocks of concrete. The bodies were placed on rails over wood, splashed with petrol, and burned. It was a harrowing sight, according to one witness with the bellies of pregnant women exploding from boiling amniotic fluid. The witness wrote that the heat radiating from the pits was maddening. The bodies burned for five hours without the ashing of bones. The pyres operated 24 hours a day, and once the system had been perfected, 10 to 12,000 bodies at a time were incinerated. The open-air burn pits were located east of the new gas chambers and refueled from 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. in roughly five-hour intervals. The work at Treblinka was carried out under threat of death by Jewish prisoners organized into specialized work details. At the second camp, the receiving area squad had a different colored triangle. The triangles made it impossible for new arrivals to try to blend in with members of the work details. The blue unit managed the rail ramp and unlocked the freight wagons. They met the new arrivals, carried out people who had died en route, removed bundles, and cleaned the wagon floors. The red unit, which was the largest squad, unpacked and sorted the belongings of victims after they had been processed. The red unit delivered these belongings to the storage barracks, which were managed by the yellow unit, who separated the items by quality. 
removed the Star of David from all outer garments, and extracted any money sewn into the linings. The yellow unit was followed by another group, who disinfected the belongings, including sacks of hair from women who had been murdered there. An additional unit, the Gold Jews, collected and counted banknotes and evaluated the gold and the jewelry. Another group of about 300 men, called the Taunton Juden, or Jews for the Dead, lived and worked in Camp 3, across from the chambers. For the first six months, they took the corpses away for burial, after gold teeth had been extracted. Once cremation began in early 1943, they took the corpses to the pits, refueled, crushing the remaining bones with mallets, and collected the ashes for disposal. Each trainload of deportees brought to Treblinka consisted of an average of 60 heavily guarded wagons. They were divided into three sets of 20 at the layover yard. Each set was processed within the first two hours of backing onto the ramp, and then was made ready by the Sonder commandos to be exchanged for the next set of 20 wagons. Members of all work units were continuously beaten by the guards and often shot. Replacements were selected from the new arrivals. There were other work details which had no contact with the transports. Conditions were very difficult, and many Sonder Commando prisoners hanged themselves at night. Suicides in the barracks occurred at the rate of 15 to 20 per day. The work crews were almost entirely replaced every few days. Members of the old work detail were murdered, except for the most resilient. The camp was dismantled in late 1943. A farmhouse for a watchman was built on the site and the ground plowed over in an attempt to hide the evidence of genocide. Neither the Jewish religious leaders in Poland nor the authorities allowed archaeological excavations at the camp out of respect for the dead. Approval for a limited archaeological study was issued for the first time in 2010, to a British team from Staffordshire University using non-invasive technology and LIDAR remote sensing. The soil resistance was analyzed at the site with ground-penetrating radar. Features that appeared to be structural were found, two of which were thought to be the remains of the gas chambers, and the study was allowed to continue. The archaeological team performing the search discovered three new mass graves. The remains were reinterred out of respect for the victims. At the second dig, the findings included yellow tiles stamped with a pierced mullet star resembling a Star of David and building foundations with a wall. The star on the tile was soon identified as the logo of a Polish ceramics manufacturing factory founded in 1886, nationalized and then renamed under communism after the war. As explained by forensic archaeologist Karian Sturdy Calls, the new evidence was important because the second gas chambers built at Treblinka were housed in the only brick building in the camp, and Coles claimed that this provides the first physical evidence for their existence. In his memoir describing his stay in the camp, survivor Jankiel Wiernik says that the floor in the gas chambers which he helped build was made of similar tiles with the logo on it. In the post-war Polish People's Republic, the government bought most of the land where the camp had stood and built a large stone memorial there between 1959 and 1962. In 1964, Treblinka was declared a national monument of Jewish martyrdom in a ceremony at the site of the former chambers.